team-based, um, takes place in the near future. Very colorful, lots of action, great game. Highly recommended, maybe a little biased. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is sort of my life journey through programming up to that point, uh, sort of concluding with my uh, time on Team 4 working on Overwatch. So, um, and at, at which point I'll just sort of open the floor to question if you guys want to talk about pretty much anything having to do with that. Um, so I'll then get started then. Uh, I started programming probably around six years old. Uh, there was a teacher who uh, really thought that we were capable of uh, getting started with something like uh, Applesoft Basic. I don't know if any of you have ever worked with something like that. Um, but I started with an Apple IIc and was working with Basic. And at first it was just, you know, plot and H line and B line just to sort of draw very simple images, H and B line for horizontal and vertical line. And you could draw very, very simple images. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. I can make neat little things on the computer. But it wasn't until I started realizing, oh, wait, there's this thing called loops. You can write a for loop. You can write an if statement. You can say input, and then the user types something in. And you can do something based on that input. And that sort of like exploded my world at six years old. So I started doing a lot of work with basic um, sort of did other things in middle school. And then around high school, I started working in C and C++. Um, and then I actually went uh, to college early on uh, for music composition. And uh, quickly realized I was spending all of my free time you know, working on games, working on programming stuff, not doing my studies in music. Uh, so I, I realized, you know what, I should probably just switch majors. So that's what I did. Uh, I finished uh, University of Georgia with a degree in computer science. Uh, at which point I had a lot of work both in, uh, at school but also in my free time. So I had a little portfolio of projects. And I started applying to jobs all over the industry. Um, I think I applied to 12 jobs total before I actually got someone who wanted to talk to me over the phone. Uh, and so after being grilled for a very long time over the phone in math, which I wasn't expecting, uh, he decided he was going to fly me out for an interview, so I went out. Interviewed, flew out here to Irvine, uh, interviewed at a company called Swing Mate Studios. Uh, at the time, they were working on StarCraft Ghost. Um, spoiler alert, the project was indefinitely postponed a few years later, but at the time, I was very excited. Uh, so I, I got the job uh, and started working first on uh, various weapons, um, projectile stuff. I then also developed some uh, tech for what we call mobile structures which were, uh, for those of you familiar with StarCraft, uh, the, Terran, uh, the Terrans can actually create buildings that fly around. And we were trying to sort of bring that into an action, sort of third person perspective kind of game. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a, a fun mode going on there. Uh, where you're supposed to capture the base, floating in the middle of the map, and you fly it over to one side, land it, fly it over the other side, get the other team. And uh, anyway, long story short, the project did not work out. Um, it was indefinitely postponed in 2006, I think it was. Um, at which point, uh, we weren't really sure what projects we wanted to do next. Um, we had actually since then been purchased by Blizzard, so Swing Age Studios became Blizzard console in, uh, I think, May of 2005. Um, 2006, project was canceled. We were trying to figure out what we were going to do next. And uh, they ended up dissolving that team, and most of us got moved over to other projects at Blizzard. So that's how, in 2006, I ended up uh, joining the World of Warcraft team. So I was on World of Warcraft for about three years, where I uh, worked with a great bunch of people, uh, had a lot of fun, uh, developed vehicle tech, uh, which was basically allowing you to sort of attach to other objects and also allow various uh, units to sort of lob projectiles. Um, I also worked on visual effects and a few other things. Uh, I was there for sort of the end of Vanilla WoW uh, through Burning Crusade, Wrath of the Lich King. Uh, and I did a little bit of work on the uh, Cataclysm, which was the next expansion. Um, I, didn't, I didn't see that one through to the end. I actually left in 2009 to join this really cool, exciting project um, on Team 4 called Titan, Project Titan. Uh, and I spent, I guess, the next four years working on Project Titan. Um, that project also was canceled, it turns out. Um, so in, uh, I guess it was 2013, it was shut down. And the team was sort of in a similar situation to what I'd been in before. We were trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do next? And 
tried a bunch of different things, different prototypes. And I was actually, I sort of scheduled a week off, I was on vacation, and I came back and the atmosphere, instead of sort of being, oh no, what are we gonna do next, the atmosphere had completely changed. So apparently, while I was gone on vacation, they had decided what they were going to do. Uh, they were gonna make Overwatch, or what was going to become Overwatch. And so, unfortunately, I was not there for the one week where all the, all the cool stuff went down. Um, so anyway, uh, they apparently had pitched the idea, or one of our designers had pitched the idea, and uh, the game director, Jeff Kaplan, realized, like, oh, this is a great idea. This is exactly what we should do. And pitched it to the rest of the team, and the rest of the team immediately bought in. And so it was one of those things where, like, we just basically lightning struck, and we all knew what we were making. Uh, and so that's how, in sort of mid to late 2013, I guess it was, we all just sort of buckled down and said, you know what, this is it, we're gonna make Overwatch, it's gonna be awesome. Uh, in early 2014, we had our first milestone, um, and that went really well. We got buy-in from the executives and all that. And then 2014, that year, uh, we went to BlizzCon and unveiled it to the world. And that was a really, really exciting like year and a half where we went from, oh no, what are we doing, to, hey world, here's our new game. <laughs> uh, that was really cool. Um, I don't know if I'll ever have an experience quite like that reveal moment at any other point in my life. Um, so yeah, and, and I've of course been working on Overwatch ever since then. Um, so we had then our, our march to uh, releasing the game in 2016, May of 2016. Um, I think in 2015, after we had already showed the game to people, after they'd already played it, uh, I realized, oh wait, I need to rewrite a core piece of the technology, <laughs> which was our projectile system, because I had a version of the projectile system that I'd written for Titan way back in the day. And we carried it over to try to work with it on Overwatch, but it, it, it turned out it needed a lot of work. So I was I was able to sort of rewrite it while in the middle of implementing the other I think nine heroes that we had at launch. So that was that was a very exciting 2015. Uh, so the other work that I've been doing on both Titan and Overwatch is developing a scripting system uh, that we've been using. Um, I won't go into too much detail here because I don't have a, a visual aid to go with. It's a visual scripting language. Uh, but we've been using that pretty much ever since Titan, although it's changed considerably since its early inception. Um, but we use it to power you know, weapons and abilities, um, game modes, stuff like that, our UI. Uh, and so I've been working mostly with that. I've been working with the projectile system. Uh, I've actually helped implement a lot of the game modes that we've had, uh, both the existing ones and then the new ones that we uh, have released since the launch of the game. Um, and then I guess recently, uh, I've been working on something called the Overwatch Workshop, um, which is a new feature for giving our players the ability to sort of craft their own gameplay experiences, uh, whether that's a new game mode, or if it's a modification to existing game modes, or sort of new approaches, <coughs> things like that. Um, that was sort of a project that was dreamed up by, originally, uh, my lead engineer uh, that I report to, Keith. Uh, he had this really cool idea, and I sort of latched on and was like, yeah, we should totally do that. And so we sort of did these uh, very brief sort of two-day demos or uh, hackathons, if you will, where we got to spend some time and work on whatever we wanted. Uh, we, we get those about once a year. We had a few days to just sort of work on whatever. And I remember in 2017, I said to him, well, we should, we should work on that. That sounds like a really cool idea. So we spent some time doing it then, uh, sort of sat on the back burner for a while. We decided to sort of evolve that a little bit more at uh, the 2018 hackathon, which was in November. And uh, that's sort of when it sort of caught the attention of everybody. And, and uh, Kaplan came to us and said, hey, how would you guys like to actually do that for real? And so we, uh, we basically spent the last five months or so sort of turning it from an early prototype into, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it on the PTR right now. Um, that's our public test realm, where uh, sort of our ideas go to get tested out and debug and stuff like that. Um, but that's sort of where we are right now. Um, so that's sort of the, the story of where I came from and, and where I'm headed. <laughs> uh, I don't fully know what comes next, I'll be honest. I think probably more workshop stuff in the immediate future, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, uh, that's sort of my time on Overwatch and my life experience leading up to it. Um, the, the Overwatch team, Team 4, is, is a great team. I've, I've had a lot of fun making friends on that team. I've learned so much since I started. I, I started I guess almost 10 years ago now we're on Team 4. It'll be 10 years in September. And I've made lots of friends, I've learned lots, and uh, it's a great group of people. So anyway, that is my time.
uh, on Overwatch and everything leading up to it. So at this point, I uh, could open the floor to questions. So if you guys want to know anything about what I've been working on or anything having to do with Blizzard, uh, feel free to go ahead and ask. Yeah. So, you said that you came in as a music major. That's correct. Um, I'm curious as to why. So, I've actually been doing a lot of uh, music composition work. I, I took a lot of piano lessons, and uh, actually, at some point in high school, started taking composition lessons, trying to write music. And uh, I, I had a lot of success with it, and it was going well. Um, but I, I was always sort of split between two worlds because I was also spending a lot of my time programming. And, and so, um, I ended up going to school in composition because I decided to pick one at some point. Uh, and that, that was you know, a really enjoyable experience. Uh, I, it, it turns out that I was spending all my time you know, programming. So I, I realized at some point I should probably you know, be honest with myself and switch majors. But music's still something that I do in my spare time. I play piano a lot. Um, it's a lot of fun. So. So this is like kind of a very broad topic, and I'm not exactly sure how true it is for OP systems. Just update and a pretty much fixed order, although there are variations of ECS that allow for sort of inserting systems to execute at different points, uh, depending on what that particular frame needs. Uh, but for the most part, you know the order in which all of the systems are going to update. And it makes it really easy to sort of reason about, um, well, when, when does the rendering stuff happen? If you go back to other models, preceding ECS, uh, just sort of standard entity component systems, what would happen is you would take or update a particular entity, and you do all of your work for that entity. So whether that's input or weapons or rendering, you sort of do it all in one spot, and then you go on to the next entity. And it may actually made it very difficult to say, like, well, hold on, I, I actually don't have enough information to render this guy correctly, because he hasn't updated yet. And it would lead to all sorts of really bizarre scenarios. Um, or, or, you know, I can't really resolve the damage for that guy yet, because he might have played a buff on himself. And, and, and so you, you end up with these weird scenarios that are actually much easier to resolve if you have a very fixed update order. So uh, my experience with ECS has been a very positive one. Um, it's, our project is not 100% ECS. Uh, that's sort of a lofty goal that we, because we were pulling some of our code over from Titan, we weren't able to fully realize ECS in, in a way that it should have been realized. Um, the scripting system, which I talked about before that I worked on, that was actually an example of something that was not at all ECS friendly. So there's this sort of big, this big blob right in the middle of all of our systems updating where a bunch of scripting work happens. Um, it sort of violates all the cool stuff I just talked about. Uh, but for the most part, we, we have been pretty good about using ECS on Overwatch, and I, I think it's paid dividends for us. What was your portfolio like um, going into uh, coming out of college and going into applying for all of your uh, interviews? Um, so I had, I, you know, I might have a little bit here. <laughs> Let's see if I can, I can just show it to you guys. I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, I, this is a website I made back in 2004, and I updated I think once since then. So if you want a really, really old <laughs> one, you know, HTML coded by hand website. Uh, actually, I don't know if this is connected to the internet or not. I think it is. Uh, let me, yeah. My laptop's working. Oh, there we go. Oh, take it. So this is the website I made uh, in 2004. You can see I updated it once in uh, 2006 with a, uh, an album of music that I made. Um, but I will, I will just go ahead and show it to you since you were asking. Uh, so I did a bunch of projects on the side. This one's from 2000. By July 11th. It's actually a magic eye generating program. So you give it a depth map and then a, a pattern, and it turns the pattern and the depth map into a, a magic eye. Um, that's the one we look at at Funny, and eventually the other top one. I also worked on this, which it's a pangram generator. Uh, and this is a self, it's a self documenting pangram, meaning it has every letter in the alphabet, and it tells you how many letters in the alphabet that it has. Um, if you ever try making one of these, you'll find it's kind of tricky because as soon as you type it out, you realize that your counts are wrong, and you'll try to adjust the counts, but in doing so, you'll change the counts again. So what this does, it's, it's actually a fairly simple program. It just sort of mutates itself and goes through lots of iterations and just spends millions and millions and millions of cycles doing that until it finally stumbles across one where it gets all 26 letters correct, and then it spits out the answer. 
So it starts with, the way it works is you give it sort of a prefix, like uh, this computer generated pangram contains, or you know, Dan's self-documenting pangram has, and then it basically figures out like, well, can I actually make this work? Um, I've had a few uh, that never actually finished. So, and I don't know if it would have ever finished. Uh, I left it running all night, it didn't provide an answer. Um, but it was the only one, and I actually don't remember what the, the prefix was. There's only one I've ever tried where it wasn't able to come up with a solution for it. Uh, but most, most of the time it can figure it out in you know, a few minutes. Anyway, that was, that was sort of a fun program, but going back in time a little bit, those are, those are the updates, let's go to the software section here. Um, so there you can see, the last time I updated it, I was working on Rapid Village Game back in 2007. Uh, so this, this was it, this is basically the portfolio that I sent everyone. Uh, it was pretty simple, it just sort of went in, uh, I'm gonna go back before StarCraft goes. So starting with Scurry, Scurry was the sort of my flagship thing that I had worked on and developed. Um, to sort of show off, like, hey, I can do OpenGL, I can do physics, I can do UI, I can do whatever you need me to. Please hire me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a. Uh, I don't know if I. I think I can just download this. It's it's for uh, Windows XP. You know, it still probably works. Um, but yeah, so I, I did that. Uh, I made a, a little game development engine, GDE. Uh, I didn't actually finish it, so I don't know if that really counts, but. It was sort of a fun um, project in the way I spent many years. Actually, I say many years, and it looks like I only spent about one year. A <laughs> uh, year and a half. It felt like many years. I spent a lot of time on that thing. All right, let me see what this downloaded. Sorry, right, I've never used this laptop before. <laughs> uh, here we have Blame Rock. <laughs> I don't really know what we purchased. Um, yeah, this may have been a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to extract this. Let's show you Scurry. This, this was sort of the, I think this was the thing that got fired. So it was probably worth showing to answer your question. Um, oh, jeez. Um. <laughs> is, is this a bad idea? Now I can just sort of plow through all these guys. 
which is very satisfying. It's like popping a bubble wrap. There's, there's a little bit of friction here. You see he's sort of sometimes, or not friction, but the opposite of that slip, where he's, he's trying to like gain traction and stuff. Anytime you knock the ball off, it'll respawn there in the middle. Uh, and there's one other thing you can do, which is you can have, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no, oh no, I think, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, the one other thing you can do is have all the balls chase after you. Oh, wait, that's the camera. Hold on. I know, I know how this works. I totally made it. Uh, that's what I do. Now you can see they're all kind of coming out. Which, if you're this size, is kind of nice. It's like, you know, if they think you're daddy or something. But if you're, if you're smaller, it's much more terrifying. Um, but anyway, this was, uh, this was probably what got me hired. Um, I didn't even know what I was making, to be honest, when I started. I, I was like, well, what if I could do some like collision between spheres and maybe they're spinning and maybe I could render that. I don't know. I, just, I kind of just improvised for a year and a half and came up with this um, instead of, you know, baby and stuff like that. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go back to, sorry, don't look. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> right, so we're back at the uh, website. Um, there's some other stuff I worked on. I worked on a gravity simulator. Um, fortunately, that was only for Mac OS and only for the old. Like, <clears throat> it kind of ran on early versions of Mac OS 10, but it's mostly Mac OS 8 and before. Um, but you could, I'll show you uh, different screenshots here. You could, it was a 3D gravity simulator. I don't know what wow. to tell you. It, it would do things like you could trace lines, so you can see. Uh, there were these two fixed bodies and a bunch of little tiny bodies sort of falling into orbit around it. Um, and then uh, I think I have a video of this. Let me show No, sorry, don't have to pull it. Anyway, it was uh, yeah, it was sort of like a pretty hardware accelerated uh, software rendered uh, experience, which was exciting, and terrifying. Um, went to Digipen for a semester. I don't know. Do any of you guys have been to Digipen? Or? I applied there. I guess I'm just kidding. Yeah. I, I spent a semester there and then decided not to finish. So we're very similar in that. Um, Digipen's a great place. Uh, they actually, the only reason I left was because I had a lot of experience before Digipen, so I didn't really need to do their full four-year program, but they were kind of expecting me to. So I was like, well, I'll just I'll go back to the University of Georgia and finish my degree in two years. Uh, so that's what I did. Um, there was an old software library called Sprite World. Uh, it was mostly for the Mac. Uh, and so I, I spent a lot of time sort of working with that. I, I contributed to that library a little bit. Uh, it's just a 2D Sprite and, you know, tile map scrolling library. Um, and then these basically get progressively less interesting as you go down. Uh, I, I sort of sorted them by, you know, how interesting I thought they were. Actually, I'm going to give a special shout out to Anagrammarian because it is an anagram generator, which, which is kind of fun. Um, <laughs> anyway, so that was my portfolio. Is there anything else you want to say about it that answer your question? I think that about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time on that on that one question. Any other questions? It's like uh, you've done like uh, so from the looks of things, uh, are you like have you done physics simulations before? Yeah, just the the scurry what you saw there. That was probably the most extensive uh, physics work that I've done. Um, where I was actually doing all the programming of the physics. Uh, Overwatch uses quite a bit of physics, uh, but that's all handled by uh, Aaron Cotto, who's a very, very talented uh, uh, physics programmer. So um, I mostly just benefit from his work. <laughs> yeah. uh, just another question. Um, like, can you, uh, can you like, uh, describe uh, some of the differences between uh, single player and multiplayer game development? Probably the biggest, uh, I mean, I guess it's obvious, but uh, the, the biggest difference is the fact that you have to make it multiplayer, like the fact that you have to synchronize it over the internet. Um, now, there's there's a different challenge if you're trying to do a split screen, like you know, or or some other co-op game on one screen. My experience with multiplayer has just been, guess what? Everything has to be synchronized over the network, and everyone has to kind of more or less agree on what they're playing, because otherwise it's just not really a game anymore. Um, 
so yeah, the, the, the biggest difference is having to figure out who's going to be authoritative over the data. Um, there are different models. Uh, most models these days are server authoritative, um, where the server basically decides how things are and just tells the clients. Um, there are other models like peer-to-peer -peer or client authoritative, um, and they have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, there, some things like uh, client authoritative are a little bit easier to understand, but also much easier to hack. So if you don't like cheaters in your game, uh, you should stick with server authoritative, where basically all you're really telling the server is what you want to do. The server decides what really happens and then tells all the clients what really happened. Um, the clients get to do one more exciting thing, which is they get to make predictions about what's going to happen. Uh, that's why you can have a, a multiplayer game where even though you're not authoritative over what happens, you, it still feels responsive. So you'll, you'll move around, you'll shoot at people or whatever you're doing in the game. It, it still feels fun. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question. That, that's probably the biggest single difference is just having to worry about all of that networking stuff. Okay. Um, so it looks like you kind of mostly use C++ for most of your portfolio, and I'm assuming Overwatch also uses C++. That's correct. Um, do you have any specific like gripes about the language? Uh, because the, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with John Manuel. Mm -hmm. um, he has a lot of very specific gripes about C and C++ um, in trying to um, trying to design in a data-oriented way and how cache behavior of like trying to use all of their structures yeah. So, do you have any like specific gripes about C and C++ for game development? Um, short answer is probably yes. I think anytime you have a language is developed and it's been around as long as C++, there are going to be specific things about it you don't like. Um, I need to be, be careful what I say here, uh, not to make too many enemies. Um, but, but the truth is, you're, you're probably not always find stuff in a language that doesn't quite line up with the way you develop. Um, fortunately, C++ is an extremely uh, diverse language. There's so much stuff you can do in there. There's so many different styles and dialects of programming in C++. Um, the ones that we use uh, on, on Overwatch and the ones that a lot of companies use in the game industry is it's basically sort of a much smaller subset of the functionality that lends itself well to basically making games, uh, but also just working in a large group of people. Um, we, use, we do use some advanced features when it, it calls for it, but I would say the, the vast majority of our code is, um, in terms of the C++ features that we use on top of just straight C, we use classes, we use uh, virtuals when uh, it's not too performance intensive. Uh, vir virtuals shouldn't be that much worse than just like a function pointer. So you can kind of simulate that in, in uh, straight C as well. Um, and the performance would be similar, so it's kind of harder to do. So that's why virtual functions are kind of nice. Um, we use templates, but we try not to overuse templates because you can very quickly make code that's unreadable if you're really doing a lot of template stuff. Um, so we use it for containers and things like that. But we, and, and sort of generic types, if we have a, a, a generic type that we need to share, it's, it's more convenient if the, the accessors are all template function. Um, but for the most part, we uh, focus on sort of C++ um, uh, classes. Uh, I guess we have classes, we have virtual functions, um, we have inheritance. We try not to do too much multi-inheritance. Um, every once in a while something will use it, that's generally, you know, you, do that. uh, you can shoot yourself in the foot pretty easily if you're not careful. Um, but, so we, I don't know, I, I have my own personal gripes with C++, as I'm probably sure I'd have about any language if I spent 15, 20 years working in it. Uh, mostly around things like syntax and just understandability. I think a lot of the more advanced features of C++ can be extremely intimidating to newcomers, for example. Um, I've always found it weird that one of the first things you learn in C++ uh, involves overriding the string operator, because a lot of times you'll see C out and C in. It's one of the very first things you use. And it's actually kind of an advanced feature, because you're talking about What's this, what's this thing? Well, that's a bit stream operator, but it's not using, it's, it's not actually doing bit shifting right now. It's actually, well, we had to override it to do this other thing. It's a really weird introduction, I've always thought, um, because at least for me, like coming from a background in programming in basic and various dialects of basic, uh, functions made sense to me. Like I understood functions, and C in and C out, the way they work, doesn't resemble a function at all. You're actually sort of, there's a hidden 
reference to an object behind the scenes that's getting passed around from one operator to the next. And it's, I, I've always found that, it, I mean, it's cool, it, like it looks neat, but it's actually really kind of complicated and messy under the hood. So if you're sort of an inquiring mind, you're like, okay, how does that actually work? And suddenly you, you peel back the, the curtain and it's just like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's what C++ is? Anyway, that's, that's sort of a, a minor gripe, more about how it's taught than anything. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to the language. Um, I think the, my best advice would be you know, pick, pick the subset that you're comfortable with. And you know, that's not to say you shouldn't look around at some other features from time to time. I've, I've learned some stuff. I've been using uh, move operators, uh, or uh, sorry, uh, move constructors and uh, R value references recently, more and more uh, to make sure I'm not copying objects around. Um, and that's cool. You know, it's cool when, when new features show up and you can incorporate them. Uh, but there's large, large portions of C++ that I'm mostly ignorant of and to be honest, a little terrified of at first. Uh, and I think that's just going to be true of any language that's as diverse as it is. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. Uh, what's something as technical as you like that you're really proud of that went into Overwatch, like something that maybe normal people wouldn't notice that, that it's, you know, that you put in that you're like, ah, oh, I feel really smart for doing that. Well, certainly the thing I spent the most time on was our scripting system, um, which actually has turned out pretty well. So people tend to like it, and it tends to enable us to do a lot of stuff pretty quickly, sort of rapid iteration. Um, it's probably outside the scope of this talk, but if you want to hit me up afterwards, I can. I, I will talk your ear off about like how the scripting system works. It's a it's a visual scripting language. Um, if, if you guys have used Unity or Unreal, you're probably familiar with some visual scripting languages. But this one is a little bit different because it's, its focus is on turning on and off states, as we call them, in your graph. Um, and that enables you to have uh, what we call declarative logic as opposed to imperative logic, um, which was kind of an accident, to be honest. Uh, we didn't know we were doing that at first, but declarative logic and sort of trees of declarative logic can actually make it much easier to, to design complex interactions and complex abilities and systems. Um, as an example in Overwatch, let me, sorry, let me talk about a little bit about the declarative logic just real quick. Uh, that's when you have, uh, when you're, instead of saying like do this, then that, and then check this variable, then do this other thing, instead you're saying while this is true, these things should be happening. And that's sort of the, the grammar that you're using to describe the scenario that you're trying to set up. So you know, while I'm not stunned, then uh, listen for button presses, and while this button is being held, you should start shooting bullets. But if any time you become stunned, everything downstream from there turns it off automatically. You don't have to think about it. Um, it's a great way to sort of build lifetime uh, concerns, or handle lifetime concerns, uh, and build that into your design. Um, that was sort of something I was proud of, uh, even if it was sort of by accident, uh, coming up with the, the declarative scripting model that we use. Um, so I'm trying to get some new people in here. Yes? Uh, what are your interactions like with uh, some of the other departments in the Overwatch team, such as like the uh, audio department or the art team or the design team? So uh, it's great. Um, we sort of sit in different locations around the building, but every once in a while they'll come over and have questions, and, or we'll have some something we need to figure out, so we'll walk over there. And and uh, I mean, everyone's very friendly. It, the the general vibe on the team is doesn't really matter what you're doing. If someone comes to you asking for help, it's because you can help them much faster than they can figure out. And so you're really just helping the whole team by helping them. That's sort of a good mentality to get into whenever you're, you're working on a large team. Because you're not going to know everything. No one's going to know everything. And someday it's going to be you who needs help from someone else. So generally you want to get into this mentality of like, yes, I'm going to help other people, even if I spend half my day doing it, which is true. I probably spend about half my day helping other people, not doing my own work. Um, but that's OK. It's, it's a facilitate. You know, you're helping. You're, you're, you know, you're the oil that's helping everything happen. Um, so. To answer your question, my, my interactions have been very positive. Uh, they're all a great bunch of guys. Um, I've interacted a lot with audio, a whole lot with design, a little bit less with art, but that's just because the particular things I've been focusing on don't intersect with art as much. Um, uh, engine programmers did a lot of artists all the time. That's sort of what they do. Um, I, I deal a lot with designers. Um, but no, my, my interactions with them have been very positive. Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, so, like you said, recently uh, you just released the uh, workshop in Overwatch. Yes. And that was just kind of something that you had worked on somewhat and then it became a feature. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything else that uh, you're working on or that you know of kind of going on that we 
might see in the future, such as a map editor or Jetpack Pad. Or <laughs> <laughs> there is lots of cool stuff being developed. Um, I unfortunately can't really comment on future things, as you might guess. It's outside the scope of what I can talk about today. But uh, rest assured, we are working on this one. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned function pointers earlier. Yeah. Do you have any tips on how to read them? On how to read function pointers? Yeah, or like, because they're notoriously like hard to yes. parse in your brain. Yes, they are. I actually, anytime I have to use a function pointer, I look up the syntax for I'll be honest. <laughs> I, I tend to not use function pointers that often. Okay. Um, it, it's something I. I I try to use uh, features of C++ where I can, where it makes sense to. I think the uh, the class paradigm works really well there, especially it's sort of the functor paradigm, if you're familiar with functors. Um, just sort of like very, very small C++ classes that are just interfaces basically with a virtual function. It's very easy to just sort of pass those around, override stuff as you need to. I do that way more often than I actually use uh, function pointers. Um, I have used function pointers before. Uh, but yes, the syntax is a little bit baffling for it. I mean, it would be nice if it were just like a keyword like function. And then yeah. it is, oh, that's a function. It's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are, have, are there any games you've been playing recently that you've enjoyed or that have made you think, oh, I want to do this now or experiment with? Um, I don't know about the second part. Uh, I Well, maybe, maybe the second part a little bit. So I've, I've been a big fan of the Metroid series forever since I was a kid. Um, it's the very original Metroid came out, and I was sort of lost in the world of exploring that, you know, four-bit color or eight-bit color, whatever you want to call it. Uh, anyway, that that whole series is, has always been something I loved, um, and I think sort of one of my future side projects at home is you know working on a uh, sort of my love letter to the Metroidvania series. But that's it's still a ways out. I have this other side project I'm working on at home, which is sort of a sound editing program. So I probably won't get to that one until after I finish that. <laughs> First one. Um, these, by the way, are, I'm not even sure I'm ever going to release these. These are just things that I, I work on in my spare time. Um, but recently, because there haven't been any Metroid games recently, probably the most interesting game to come out recently, that I think, is uh, actually Baba is You. <laughs> see a lot of heads bobbing up and down here. Yeah, that's, I really enjoyed that out of that game. It's so fresh and interesting. I mean, I've never seen a puzzle game where you're basically kind of programming to go. I and mean, it's kind of, I think someone recently proved it was Turing complete. Um, so yeah, it, I've, I've had a lot of fun with Bob Lee's uh, and you know, I've played the recent Mortal Kombat that came out, which is sort of at the other end of the spectrum in terms of like what part of the brain it's engaging, it's very different. I enjoy that one too. Actually, just kind of a funny note, there are some people in the lab playing Bob Lee's U before yeah. talk. Yeah, I, I completed four of the worlds. Uh, I've actually, I think, technically finished the game because I, I got the ending credits, but I probably didn't really beat the game until I mastered everything. Um, it's a fun, it's a fun. Yeah? Have you ever thought about um, producing your indie game or starting your indie studio? Do you have any advice for 